Okay, so as a quick reminder, uh, I'll show you the network folder just in case you need the items that were there from last time. Your computer should be on uh, on the desktop at the top left corner. You can double click the computer icon at the top left. And then there is a, um, a classroom drive Z, Z as in zebra. And then the first folder at the top, Classroom Data 2017, you can open that folder. If you scroll down, we'll see our class, Campus Fall uh, SEO. That's our class. You can open that, and you will see the items from last week. The notes, the syllabus, the long tail keyword strategy graphic, and all of that. So all of that is from last week. There's actually one new item. There's Campus SEO number two, Webmaster Tools. So you do want to grab a copy of that. Copy that to your desktop or your flash drive. You'll be able to print it a little later, or you can email it to yourself. So go to that network folder and copy the Campus SEO number two, Webmaster Tools. I'm also going to set myself up to write notes, and you can do so as well on real paper or here on our computer. Remember to take the file with you. If you leave it on the desktop or anywhere on our computer and you expect to come back next time, it's not going to be here anymore. <coughs> we have software that erases the computer when you turn it off, and therefore if you haven't saved any of the files that you want to take with you, they won't be here next time. Your files. My files will be fine, but your files will be deleted. So we'll look at that webmaster file together in just a moment. Item number two. I'm going to write a few notes first, and then we will open that file and uh, do the things that are in it and uh, learn today's concepts. So I'm going to write some notes here. Today's big topic is Webmaster Tools. Uh, did it go this side over here? OK, uh, I think everyone. So Webmaster Tools, the official portal of the search engines. Use it to learn all about the official rules for SEO. We're trying to optimize our website to the search engines. And in this three-week class, I divulge many of the secrets and techniques and the do's and don'ts of SEO. But we can get all of those and more from the search engines directly from their webmaster tools portal. And the good thing is also for free. They put out these guidelines and do's and don'ts and other tools like to test your site and such and they put it out there for free because they want real websites from real people to, to be set up the right way and, and to help cut out the spam. So we're going to set up Bing Webmaster Tools, Google Search Console, and Google Analytics today. all three of those because in this class as I said we're covering Google search and Bing search Bing has their portal and Google has several um, I think this is kinda of funny a little bit annoying Google has a lot of great products but they technologically Google is is very very high but like sort of like design wise and user friendliness they're not as good as they could be even though they've got so many talented people 
working for them. For example, here, all that you need to know about Bing search is in one place, the Webmaster Tools. But what you need to know and use for Google is in two places right here, not to mention some other ones that I won't even mention because there's less, too much to, to work on. And that often happens with, with Google that there's lots of great technology and tools, and it's like tools by engineers made for engineers. So sometimes it can be a little clunky or difficult to understand, the Google stuff. Bing is a search engine that came out after Google, so they kind of saw what Google did and said, well, we can do it, we can do it better, we'll make it a little easier, perhaps. So we're going to cover both, the Bing Webmaster Tools and the Google Webmaster Tools. So what are they? They uh, teach you the best practices. They update you on changes to the algorithm. The algorithm is the trade secrets, uh, proprietary code, or techniques that the search engines use to rank a website. Google has an algorithm that says, remember when we did search last week and we searched in those variety of ways and we got different results in each search engine? Well, Google said, according to our data, this is, these are the best 10 results. And Bing, with the exact same search or query, said, no, these are the 10 best results. So the algorithm is, the, is their method to determine what are the best results. And their trade secrets, their proprietary, they change every once in a while to help combat spam and give better results. We can also use the Webmaster Tools is to check the health or the status of your site. These webmaster tools can tell you if your site is too slow. And yes, the speed of your site also affects your SEO ranking. There's so many factors we'll be covering as we go on, and one of them is the speed of your site. If you've got, if you follow all the rules that we'll look here, that we'll look at here, but still your site is very slow and it takes a while for it to load up, that is one factor that may hinder you from getting to number one. You may be number two or three or four or something, but uh, even the speed of your site is one of the important things that you have to consider to rank well. And, um... Does that have anything to do with the design of the website? It often has to do uh, with the design in terms of the coding, if it's optimized. JavaScript is a very common web uh, programming language on websites, and it can be written very inefficiently and cause the site to slow down. So it's often really focused on how well is your code written so that it's efficient, and that what is what could slow down the site a lot. So these are the uh, the big ideas of, of what the search engines are. Oh, and then one more thing um, to check um, the traffic on your site. Once we set these up, we will be able to check what were the terms that people used that to search to find my site. So these can also help you figure out your long tail keyword strategy. When we talked last week, we talked about the basic keywords. We had Italian restaurant. And then long term was family style Italian restaurant in Chula Vista, more detailed. Well, these search engines can help you find your, uh, find your keywords. you find your keywords as well as the traffic which was the most popular page someone visited it can tell you really really deep things such as where did the person come from before they visited your site did they come from a different site did they come from the search engine did they come from an email where uh, from Twitter where did they come from before coming to your site all of that is uh, is data Get your data. Data that 
then helps you make decisions. Data, the information. If I know that I'm getting a lot of traffic on Facebook as opposed to Twitter, or maybe I'm getting even more traffic from Instagram, I can sort of determine uh, Instagram is working really well, so I'm going to put more effort into Instagram, less effort into Twitter, and that sort of thing. So the more you know about your site, its traffic and everything like that, the better, so that you can make decisions. That include, uh, mobile versus a desktop? Yeah, it even breaks it down that far. It even breaks it down by, by country and city. So all this information that we don't realize our web browser is giving away, general location, your history of where you came from uh, while you were browsing, all of that stuff can be uh, captured by these webmaster tools. And on the, one on the one hand, of course, it sounds very intrusive. But on the other hand, it's very useful because then I can determine my data to make decisions. Like in the real world, uh, if I have a restaurant on Main Street, I, I would like to know, where did you hear about us? Well, that's us asking them, but that's us asking for that extra information. And here, these webmaster tools will tell us all of that and more. So we, um, we, we need to set these up. These require a setup. Can be accomplished in a few ways. We have um, sort of like an identifying file is uploaded to your server. We're going to use some terms here, server and uploading and file manager and such. I'll go into the details in a moment. But one is an identifying file is uploaded to your server. Another way is um, code is added to your site. Those are the two main ways. There's some other ways that I think are more complicated that I usually don't really cover. But these are the two ways. And we'll see in detail what those mean and how to do them today. But we need to confirm. We need to set up these accounts. And then basically, we're connecting uh, your webmaster tool to your website. Well, you need to confirm it's your website. Because if you think about it, what if I set this up for my competitor's website and I can check all their traffic? <laughs> Then I can see where their traffic came from, and I can see their keywords and borrow them for my site. Well, what stops you from doing that? I, I don't believe you would do that, but let's say your competitor will do that. What's stopping your competitor from doing that is this. You have to confirm, you have to vouch that that is your site. So it's like in the real world, if someone were to ask me, where do you live? I say, I live on that mansion in La Jolla. Well, they won't believe me until they see me walk up to that mansion and unlock the door and walk in or have my butler open the door. So not until I can confirm that, yeah, that's where I live, will you believe me that that's where I live? So these webmaster tools are similar to that. We have to set it up and we have to confirm and prove this is our website. And it's not extremely complicated, but for beginners doing this, it, it will be something new, simply because, um, well, I don't know how to upload a, a file to my server. What is a server? Or I can't write code on my site. I can't do it. Yes, these things are doable. I teach, I've taught this class for years, and I get a crop of students coming all the time with a variety of experiences and skills and types of websites. And the 98% um, of the time, I'm, we're able to set this up for everyone, whether you have a WordPress site, a Dreamweaver site, a Weebly or Wix or Squarespace or just about any kind of site that we've been able to figure out how do we set this up on your site. So today is, is a day where it's going to be a lot of hands-on, one-on-one if you choose to do this together, uh, choose to do this because I will be able to kind of show as much to a certain point and then we have to pause 
for a, for a quick like in the middle of the day lab time that if you would like to do what we're doing we need to pause for you to do it and for me to help you if you're having trouble and then we continue the lecture so um, if today uh, you you wanted to do this how many of you could do this raise your hand how many of you want to try to set this up today most of you okay good so we'll, uh, we'll definitely do that Let's look at the handout that I gave you. Oh, actually, before that, any questions on what I've said so far? So let's look at the handout that I gave you so you can go back to the network folder. There's a brand new handout there, Campos SEO number two. Uh, I just added, copy that file. So from the network folder, you can copy the number two webmaster tools. Let's open it up and take a look at it together. this you'll be able to print it later when I turn the printer back on it's a little noisy so this document here let's actually jump to the second page first uh, we've got this webmaster stuff on page one but let's jump to page two first conversion goals you must decide on the goals of your company early on in my fictional business, Victor's Bakery, I want people to buy my cupcakes. Oh, I've, I've, uh, I've used this handout for years and I just realized my spelling for the first time. Buy my cupcakes. Oh, that's funny. Um, that's a conversion goal. In order to get to that goal, I have many conversion goals before that. So there's a terminology right there, conversions. Let's make some notes right here. I think I've mentioned it before, but if not, we have impressions. Remind me, did I talk about impressions and conversions last time? Okay, uh, I teach a couple of classes and I might have mi mixed them up. So here we have, uh, here we have some uh, jargon, uh, com impressions, conversions, and CTR. So impressions are people see your content now I'm using content generically to mean your website or your posts on Facebook or your videos on YouTube but we'll keep it simple with your website people see your website in a search someone searches um, bakeries and Victor's Bakery appears on the first 10 results that's an impression. People saw it. They were impressed by it in the in the terms of uh, you know that it was a that it was something that they saw. So there's impressions, conversions. People interact with your content. So thinking about a website. Well, yeah, people saw my website in the in the Google search results impression, but someone clicked my link and went to my website that was a conversion because they were converted from, from someone that had not clicked to someone that had clicked and it's very generic the terms of content and such because let's say it was a tweet that they saw but they actually read it technically that's a conversion they were converted from not reading it to reading it even better they clicked on the link in the tweet to go to the shopping cart that was a conversion and a lot of times people uh, think about just one conversion the uh, the ultimate conversion which is sales people often think about that one as the only one but there are more than one a conversion is a sale also um, people went to my website great they looked at my shopping cart or my store catalog great they added it to the shopping cart, great, but then they left the site, so they never bought. Buying the product, going through completion, that's a conversion. That's what I would call the ultimate conversion. That's ultimately what I want, people to buy my products. And 
lastly we have CTR which is click through rate it's a measure of uh, effectiveness it's a sort of a way to quantify how successful you're being let's say that with some numbers as an example impressions let's say 1000 uh, 377 people saw my my website or my post on Facebook and out of that I had um, 98 people 98 conversions meaning 98 people clicked to follow the link or to buy the product or whatever so all we have to do a CTR is uh, conversions divided by impressions and that's the CTR so if I get my calculator 98 divided by 1377 it's a seven percent seven percent uh, success rate very 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 low perhaps if that were a grade that would be like an F minus 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 so it's very low but actually in the real world that's kind of high in the real world can uh, CTR or uh, effectiveness is often in in the 1% range in the 2% I just thought of these random numbers here we will see in the when we set this up our numbers will often be a, a lot lower single digit CTR is very common 1% success 9% when you're getting into the double digits 10 12% you're doing very very well uh, I of course want you know a hundred percent conversion rate that's that's a dream that never happens because uh, impressions are so easy to define and, and quantify and then the sales and the results are so hard to achieve so even if we're at 75 percent that's you know, that's amazing you've got to deal with the devil at that point 50 percent 25 percent even at 25 percent that's amazing think about how these companies in the real world are creating commercials let's say coca-cola running commercials on every station every few hours all day long all week long their impressions are you know 300 million but they're not selling 300 million drinks they're only selling 10 million well, that's 10 million out of 300 million that's also a very small percentage so here in this case it was 7.12 percent success which is technically pretty high we will see ours as we set it up well uh, conversions uh, ultimate conversion um, I've got it right here some other kinds of conversions with real-world examples um, I, I say here my fictional vi business Victor's bakery I want to sell cupcakes that's the ultimate conversion goal in order to get to that goal I have many conversions be before that point because we'll see that um, with any business especially on online it's relatively easier to get views or likes or you get followed on social media or that sort of thing those actions are pretty easy a person clicks a button they give a like that's it they move on but then suddenly it's very hard suddenly the mouse doesn't work to click buy or donate or anything like that suddenly it's very much more difficult for the person to complete the ultimate conversion goal so I have here some examples of what you could try to do before getting to the ultimate conversion so we've got get followers on Twitter let me expound on these a little more um, examples of conversions to reach your ultimate conversion I have mentioned their Twitter I said get followers on Twitter 
So what, what that means, that, that's assuming, of course, you have a Twitter account. That's just one possible way. I, I'm not saying that all of these things that are here, you have to do them. But the more of these things that are on that list that you do, the, the more you can uh, possibly get that ultimate conversion. But I'm saying, okay, you've got a Twitter account, you want to get followers. Well, followers, the more followers you have on any social network, in this case, Twitter, the more chance, or the more, uh, yeah, the more chance uh, to raise your CTR. If I've got three followers, on Twitter and we go by the very realistic measurement of 1% meaning 1% of your followers are usually the ones that are going to be the real followers the real results uh, meaning that they will click they will buy well 1% is very low what's 1% of 3 it's a fraction just rounding it up let's say 1 out of 3 followers maybe you'll make one sale probably not if you've got a hundred followers, what's one percent of one hundred? One again. So out of a hundred followers, probably most likely only one of those one hundred, that one percent there, is going to really follow through and buy your product. So the more followers I get, the more possibility. If I have two hundred followers, one percent of two hundred is two. If I've got a thousand followers, that's ten. So the more followers I have, the more possibility, if I operate under the 1% rule, I can increase my results. And also think about it in terms of going viral. We have, um, we have Twitter where I might have um, two followers, and I and I post about this sale or this coupon I've got two followers but one of those followers really liked that tweet and they retweeted it meaning they sort of forwarded it to their followers and that one person had a thousand followers so my tweet that first reached only two people now gets amplified by this other person that had a thousand followers so I've reached a thousand and two people not just the two that I had originally so that's why I'm trying to build followers to get these connections. To build connections to reach sort of friends of friends. Connecting to those that are not connected to me at the moment uh, through the web of social media. And that's going viral. I have here get social interactions on Facebook this ties back into Twitter but this is just another example uh, using another social network this one's Facebook so that, that one of course assumes you've got a Facebook the largest social network in the world over 2 billion served no wait that's McDonald's slogan um, this is over 2 billion people use Facebook. Over 2 billion people have an account. Not million, billion. The population of the world is like 6 billion or 6.5 billion. So there's so many people in the world that have a Facebook account, meaning you can reach so many people. Social media, social networks can be used as a, uh, as a marketing tool for advertising. Uh, to reach the right audience like we have um, billboards or radio ads in the real world that's real world marketing we can have marketing and advertising digitally via Twitter Facebook Instagram etc so we can say here it's the largest marketing tool I'm currently teaching uh, a social media class, the Social Media Crash Course. It only lasts two weeks. Uh, it started this week. We had our first day on Tuesday and the second day on Thursday, 6 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. 
We have two more class meetings next Tuesday and Thursday, uh, 6 to 9.30 p.m. You can enroll in those two classes still, even though you, uh, you miss the first two days. And we're covering next Tuesday uh, Facebook uh, in good detail and also Twitter. So if anyone is interested, come back to this room 6 p.m. Tuesday and or Thursday next week for in-depth look at Facebook and Twitter. So in my notes, I'm saying I want to get these interactions of likes and shares and um, comments on Facebook, for example. It's the largest social network. So social interactions help you go viral. And going viral is reaching more people. I post something, someone sees it, they like it, they share it to someone else. They see it, they share it to someone else. It spreads like a virus going viral. So imagine I post something on Facebook about my business, a photo of a nice cupcake, and then a link that says uh, get 5% off if you uh, if you reshare this and then it, it does get spread out to more people I get more customers I make those sales but I have to reach more people I have another possibility here get site visits via Google Plus so here's another social network Google's own social network. If you've never used Google Plus, it's basically the same as every other social network. You post a picture or text, an article, video, coupons, ads, whatever. You post whatever you want on Google Plus like the other networks. And you can get people to reply, to like, to share it, just like every other social network. So then you might say, well, why do I need to be on that one if I'm already on Facebook or if I'm already on Twitter? I just It's more to do. I don't have the time. Well, as I said, it's Google's own social network. Google owns it. Off the top of your head, what else does Google own? YouTube. YouTube. Anything else? Instagram. Google search, I heard. Yes. Not, not Instagram. That's Facebook. Google search. What's that? That's the other one. That's the other one. Uh, they also own Android. So if you've got an Android phone, that comes from Google. Maps. Maps. Google Maps. You might have heard of Google, Google Mail, also known as Gmail. So Google has their hands in a lot of pies. And you don't think that they're promoting or cross-pollinating in their own system, they're going to say that no, it is completely unbiased and the results you get on Google search are, are the best, most unbiased. But uh, when we were, if you were here last week, we saw that with some unofficial testing, we saw that that might not be the case. Uh, so if you're on Google+, Plus, their own social network, if your business is on their social network, you don't think that maybe you'll get a little bit of a bump higher than the Facebook competing social network? And even if you don't get a bump, well, that's two ways that your business could appear in two of those ten slots uh, as opposed to your competitor that is only on one social network. So if you're on Google's official network, it gives you the bump definitely on Maps especially. When you search Google Maps, you get a bunch of results of businesses and the data that comes from I mean the data that is displayed to you on Google Maps comes from a Google Plus account so if you set up your business on Google Plus and put your hours of operation and your contact information that's getting served and shown to people on a Google search uh, not the Facebook results so the more visibility, the more impressions, the more I'm visible, maybe I make some videos on YouTube, video content, that's getting a lot of a, of a preference to be shown on searches. 
you search various things, you often see a top results of videos. Those videos are coming from YouTube. YouTube is owned by Google. You're doing a Google search. Makes sense. Yeah. So um, if you're doing an analysis against like, the competitor, you can literally look at, what, look at their site and see what social networks they're on and, and kind of maybe mirror or understand why they're doing that versus and give you an idea of maybe I should be on these three and maybe the fourth one doesn't make sense for us. Yeah, exactly. When we talked last week about that competitor analysis, exactly. So you hit the nail on the head. Uh, this is for the purpose of that competitor analysis to figure out what they're doing, what's working for them, how I can do it in my version, not ripping it off exactly, but seeing how I can do it in my version and seeing, well, they're not on these networks. Now, here's the thing. Uh, this requires more testing, but it could be, well, they're not on this network, so I won't do it either. Or we could say they're not on this network, so this might be a point of entry for me to get to where they're not. I have to ask why they're not there. <laughs> yeah, more research right. and figuring it out. And it could be that it's not viable that that audience on Instagram doesn't want, you know, a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Or we could see that, yeah, there is a need here, and I'll be the first one to get here as opposed to my competitor, and I'll reach that audience. So. There are more, um, so I'm saying get on Google Plus to get traffic to to my site because they probably uh, do promote their own results a little better than the competition, even though they'll officially say they don't. Next, get more hits on my home page. Uh, so this is a hits on home page or your your own site. Oftentimes, you still. need to drive traffic back to your site even if you're very active and popular on social media you could you could have a presence online that is only on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram snapchat whatever but you still want traffic back to your own site because you are beholden to the TOS of the social networks. I'll write SN, the social networks. Uh, you are beholden to the TOS of the social networks you are on. TOS, does anyone know what that stands for? In terms of service. In terms of service. So whenever we create an account on any of these social networks, there's a button at the bottom that no one notices that says, read the terms of service. And you agree to abide by them if you, if you, if you click next. So if you create almost anything online, there is a terms of service that you have not read, but agreed to. So it's very common and it's, you know, lawsuits are pending about all of that. Uh, so the terms of service usually make sense and will say you will not post here things that are illegal you will not post you know uh, violent content or harassing content or stolen goods you will not use our service for your illegality basically these these services are trying to cover themselves um, sort of like the phone company uh, you can use the plain old telephone to call and commit lots of crimes but the phone company is not responsible for that. It is your content. The online companies here are trying to do the same. We're not responsible for what you're doing, but we're going to cover ourselves by not allowing various things in the terms of service. So that means that you have to play by their rules in their playground. And if you maybe need to sell or promote something controversial, um, and you're reported, they will shut you down on their network. Your Facebook account could get shut down easily, or your Twitter, or whatever. Any of these accounts on these social networks can be set, shut down because you're, you're operating in their playground, they can kick you out of it. And these social networks really operate under a doctrine of uh, guilty until proven innocent. 
they have so many users and problems to deal with that it's just easier for them to shut down your account moving on we've got 10 more to shut down this hour so violating their terms of service can get you shut down and then it'll be very difficult to come back okay well you have free reign basically to do what you want on your own website so you may use these social networks to get exposure and drive traffic back to your website where there you can do what you want um, it's not just about oh I've got a controversial product I can only sell it on my site it's also about you have limitations on uh, these networks um, wrapping up this thought here because you're beholding to the TOS of the site you're on on your own site you have more leeway and also you have limitations there are limitations of what you can do on the social networks uh, I've taught this class for years and I would always say uh, something that now I have to change because the the network changed I would say well if I'm trying to sell something I have Twitter Facebook all of that stuff I cannot sell my product directly off of Twitter or off of Instagram or off of Facebook I have to drive people back to my website what I have to change now is that recently Facebook did set it up that now you can sell things on your Facebook so however if you are on Instagram or Twitter or snapchat or LinkedIn you can't sell anything in the Twitter account you guide people back to your website where the shopping cart is you guide people from your Instagram back to your website that's where you've got your shopping cart and that's where you collect credit cards that's where you have the full control except for Facebook they've started to add this recently I need to educate myself on it I I haven't done so just yet how it fully works but now you are able to sell products directly off of Facebook that negates my point here a little bit but let's say my audience I'm a superstar on Twitter at the moment Twitter has no way for us to sell our products right off of Twitter we still have to guide them back to our site so this is why you still want traffic back to your site this is where you've got the most leeway the most control another goal so all of these are goals I'm trying to accomplish all of these are conversions getting more traffic is a conversion setting up a Google Plus and getting activity that's a conversion all of these are going toward my ultimate conversion here's another one get more shares on my blog posts from my site okay that assumes I've got a site a website and that assumes I've got blogs so we'll talk about blogs here this is articles articles written on a regular basis I teach a class in blogging it'll happen in January blogging is part of SEO blogging creates keywords the long tail keywords blogging creates keywords when we talked about those keywords last time I talked about their importance. I didn't talk how to I didn't talk about how to use them. However, part of the way you use it is you write these articles. You write articles where you use those keywords, those long keywords and such. Uh, so that when people are searching, there is a legitimate page on your website about what they're searching. Let's say I am Victor's Bakery, I've got a website. Let's say I sell my cupcakes online, so I want traffic to my website. Let's say I have a blog, I'm gonna write articles. Uh, I'm gonna write, you know, top five alternatives to sugar, you know, plain old sugar. So I write an article and I talk about here are the healthier alternatives to refined sugar. And 
to talk about, uh, I don't know, um, turbinado sugar and I don't know, all of these things. So people are searching for those things on Google or, or Bing and here's an article that's all about that and it drives them back to my website and they read the article and they see, oh, this company uses the healthier alternatives to that sugar in their cupcakes. Let me buy one and try it out. Best, best case scenario, of course. But your blogs are a place for you to write these articles where you can legitimately use your keywords to get traffic when people search. Blogging creates keywords. Blogging can drive traffic to your site from people searching those topics. And there is an art and a science to it, and that's why I've got that class, how to blog. But uh, blogging is very important. Very quick tips here, or advice. We have blo blogging on a regular basis, and, and how much regular basis, uh, I would say, OK, I would say frequency. We have uh, for beginner once per month, one new article on your website once a month, intermediate once per week, advanced once per day, which is a lot of work. Okay, well, then we talk about length. Beginner, at least 100 words. Intermediate, at least 250 words. Advanced, at least 500 words. And you'll find plenty of articles with plenty of advice and say, make sure you blog twice a week 500 words. That is correct. And you'll find articles that say, make sure you blog at least 100 words every two weeks. That is correct as well. All of this is correct. Some amount of frequency, some amount of length. Because what's wrong is not doing it. If you don't blog, you don't create content, you don't create keywords, you don't create things for people to find and drive traffic to your site. So even if you do it quarterly, even if you do 50 words quarterly, I think that's way too sparse, but still, that's content that you're creating on a regular basis. The search engine will, will be paying attention and seeing that your site is changing and that you're creating content people are looking for. Uh, when we talk about all of these concepts of keywords, sometimes people think, okay, that means I need to change my website on a regular basis. I need to change the home page, and I need to add stuff to the, to the about page, and I need to change it in that sort of way. No, what you're changing or what you're updating, what you're adding are blogs. And every website could and should have a blog. Every site should have a blog. Even a restaurant, you know, a realtor, a... Uh, industrial power washing company all of these should have a blog because this is a place for you to uh, organically and realistically add content and yes it's gonna be harder for some industries what am I gonna write this month I think I already talked about everything I needed to write you know four months four months down the line I don't know any more things to write and it is going to be challenging on, on some industries to write on a regular basis. That's why I have the beginner, 100 words once a month. I think that's very attainable for just about any industry. Uh, in the blogging class, we would do the brainstorming and figure out much more for everyone. Yes? Are blogs interactive? <coughs> interactive, in other words, can the people respond to your... Your, your posts, your articles? Right. Yes, they can be. You can set it up to be interactive or not. Um, people can comment and reply and like and all of that. So there is that interactivity. Yeah. That is also valuable there because in the search engines see activity and they see people are reading 
and replying to these blogs that's valuable, let's rank them a little better, as opposed to no blog, no interaction. They say, well, this is not that important, why should we show it? Every site should have a blog because it's a place to organically, realistically add content to get found. We've got then get subscribers to my coupon newsletter. Well, that one assumes you've got a newsletter. And as I said, um, you don't have to do all of these things, but these are ideas of what you can do to help in all of the concept of SEO. A newsletter, which is an email sent out to subscribers on a regular basis. And this one is also arbitrary what's a regular basis. Some newsletters are sent out every day, some once a week, some three times a day. Think about yourself. Have you subscribed to a, in, in a newsletter or some other thing that in the beginning you thought it was useful, but then you get too many of them and then you stop paying attention to it or you unsubscribe? So there's that double-edged sword. People are giving you their email and then you're sending out content and some will say it's too much and then unsubscribe so yeah if you start quarterly on the newsletter uh, this is related to the blog do you think that would be too much to, or less quarterly or do you have to do like once a month because you said that they get bombarded with that email you said not email but if they quarterly you can uh, these newsletters can be set up in such a variety of ways. Um, you can set it up that when you write a new blog, yeah. it automatically sends that as a newsletter. So if you're writing your blog once a month, it oh, just gets sent once a month. It could also be set up that y every time you write that blog, it gets sent out, or you're writing a new newsletter that is unrelated. So you could be sending it out once a month, once a week, whatever. It could be tied with your blog. Or, or not. Okay. So an email sent out to subscribers on a regular basis, usually set up to have exclusive content. So if I'm already following you on Facebook and I read your blog, why would I also give you my email to get spammed? Well, you would give me your email because you're going to see things on the newsletter you can't find anywhere else. I'm not going to be writing that stuff in the blog where anyone can find it. I'm not going to be posting the whole article, the whole newsletter article, that piece on Facebook. I'm going to have it exclusive on my newsletter. Yes, it is more content to create and is more to manage, but it is something exclusive. And that could be very useful because you could use the newsletter also as stealth marketing. in between the articles or content you add ads you add coupons you add enticements to buy now you add content that are verbiage about you know sale until the end of the month so you let's say my victor's bakery i have a newsletter get the weekly recipe so let's say only on my newsletter, I'm sending out a free recipe. Uh, so we have this bakery. We're giving away these recipes. They are um, variations of the food that we sell. It's not, this, it's not the same recipe for our chocolate chip cookies. It's a little different. So we send out a, a little article about that recipe with a little bit of text. And then also down at the bottom or something, I meant we mentioned uh, now in time for the holidays, use this link to buy a, uh, a one dozen or a two dozen batch of cookies for the price of one or whatever. So giving something away for free, but then having an article, uh, I mean, having an advertisement in the newsletter. Something exclusive. 
This next one here doesn't apply to a lot of people, but if it does apply to you, think about it. Get virtual clients, which are followers, to come to my physical location. So this is, re uh, this is virtual impressions to real conversions. So taking the people that follow you on Facebook or Twitter and having them come to your physical location. Again, it doesn't apply to everyone if you don't have a physical business. If I'm a plumber, I don't have people coming to my home to hire me. I'm on the road. If uh, I'm a uh, if I'm a realtor, I might not have people. I might not have an office that people come to. I, I go to them. So the opposite is I've got a physical location. I have Victor's Bakery or I have a daycare center. I want people to that follow me on social media, virtual followers. I want them to actually come to the business in person to buy the product, to hire me, etc. So can often be difficult. It's very easy for someone to follow and to like and comment and be in the digital world, but then to get them to come in person, that can be very difficult. That's kind of hard to give a universal answer for everyone. But again, it could boil down to promote real world um, incentives from virtual ones. Here's, an, here's a perfect example. One of my hobbies is comic books. I like reading and collecting comic books. I've done it for 30 years. Uh, I went to a, a comic shop over here on, uh, I think, Adams Avenue. It's called Villainous Lair. Villainous Lair Comic Shop. So I went there. It was a really nice shop. They had a lot of great merchandise. I was there. I bought a couple things. I left. And then as I was leaving, the cashier said, hey, take our card visit our website we've got a lot of great deals on our website so that was the opposite in that I was at the physical location driving traffic back to their website well on their website are a bunch of deals to come back to the store to buy stuff they, they're having like the 12 days of Christmas kind of sale and you and you find out what those sales are on the website and then you come to the store in person to buy the items So getting people from your virtual followers to your real location can be very tricky but it's often about some sort of enticement or some sort of thing that you will that you will get if you come in person I know you follow us but come in person you'll get great stuff because that ultimately goes to the very last point here get clients to buy my cupcakes all of that all of these previous steps this is the one I want. Buy my cupcakes. But it's very hard to, to, to do that for various reasons. So we have all of these possibilities before that to that point. And as I said, you don't have to do every single one of those, but the more of those you, you think about or engage in, not all the time or some time, the more you do, the more you get, because then that's the ultimate conversion. Your sale your um, let's say I'm a public speaker I want to get hired to publicly speak um, your services rendered whatever goal whatever is your ultimate goal let's say I simply want to write articles on you know my opinions about the world I could be talking to myself with no promotion, that's not fun. I want other people to read this and uh, and see my point of view and such. I could engage in all of the stuff I've listed here about using Twitter to get that traffic or a newsletter or whatever. So ultimately for that person, all I really want is people to read my content. That's it, I'm not trying to sell them anything. I just want people to read my content. Well, maybe I really do want people to comment and tell me how great my opinions are. But I want people to come to my website to read my content. In that case, that's my ultimate conversion. In the case of Victor's Bakery, my ultimate conversion 
is for them to buy my cupcakes. Let's say I, I'm a I'm a realtor. My ultimate conversion is to get hired to buy or sell houses. So I'm going to write all. Of, I'm going to engage in all of these things. I'm going to write articles, top five tips for first-time home buyers, because that's a stealth ad to tell people, you know, these are the top tips. These are the pitfalls. Don't forget to hire a professional. You can hire me, because that's the ultimate conversion. Whatever you decide is your ultimate goal, a sale or whatever you're trying to do. You should see that it's a long, involved process to get from point A, which is a potential client follows you on Twitter, to point Z, the follower visits the store and buys a product. That is why search engine optimization goes hand in hand with search engine marketing. So remember we said SEO, search engine optimization, is what you do on your website. There were a few points here that you would do on your website. And there's a lot of points that are SEM, search engine marketing. What else are you doing besides your website? Twitter is out of your website. These newsletters are out of your website. Um, what else are you doing besides optimizing your site? You should be engaging in SEM. An emerging term that takes both into account is content marketing. And I've got a link here at Forbes.com that you can visit on your own. What, what is it? And also other examples and advice about what you could do to try to drive traffic and such. So we started on page two to kind of think about we have goals. We have various steps to get to those goals. We'll take our break, and when we come back, we'll look at page one, which is to set up our webmaster tools to help us track our effectiveness, what's working and what's not working. Any questions on what we've talked about on page two so far? OK, it's just about 10.40. We'll take a break until 10.50. Uh, when we come back, we'll look at page one and we'll set up our webmaster tools. Uh, you could take, as I said, you could take this opportunity to set up the webmaster tools if you have your login information to connect with. If you don't, you might just have to take notes and do it at home.